The New York Giants fifth OTA is in the books, and I've got loads of observations and thoughts for you coming up next on the Locked on Giants podcast. You are Locked on Giants, your daily New York Giants podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode of the Locked On Giants podcast is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the promo code Locked On NFL for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Last minute tickets, lowest prices guaranteed. Hello, New York Giant fans, and welcome to another edition of the Locked On Giants podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast family. Your team every day. My name is Patricia Chena, credential member of the New York Giants media for Locked On, as well as for. New York Giants on SI. Find the written work over at si.com slash NFL slash Giants. And welcome on in to my everydayers, my Blue Crew community members, my newcomers, and everybody in between. Thank you for spending part of your day with us here on the Locked on Giants podcast. And on today's podcast, OTA number five is in the books. I was there. It was a busy, busy day. A lot to unpack. The offensive assistant coaches were made available. Um, assistant general manager Brandon Brown was made available. Obviously, we had players uh, at the podium. And, of course, it was a practice. So I have a little bit of everything for you, a little bit of uh, observations, things that were said that, you know, I want to pass along, um, you know, and some thoughts about how things are kind of taking shape with this Giants team. So that's going to be our entire show today. Again, welcome on in. And thank you for joining us. All right, let's get started. Um, I'm going to kick things off with Carmen Brasillo because he was probably number one on my list of people that I wanted to hear from. And, uh, you know, disclaimer, I actually stayed in his media session for the the entire time. Um, I think they were available for about nine, 10 minutes. So I wanted to stay and hear what Brasillo had to say because the offensive line, as we know, is a major problem for this team. And has been in the past. So I wanted to get a sense of, you know, how Brasillo teaches, who he is as a person, um, you know, what he had to say about offensive linemen, um, his plans for Evan Neal, all that good stuff. And, uh, you know, Brasillo did not disappoint. Let me just say right off the bat, very, very sincere man, excellent speaker, um, didn't give short, choppy answers, was very thorough, was very... Um, forthright. So that was kind of appreciated. So let's get into some of what he said. Um, and some of this, you know, if you saw some of my earlier shows, if you're an everyday or you saw some of my earlier shows, when I had Hondo Carpenter on the show, and um, your boy Q, who's our locked on Raiders host, had them on the show. This was back when they hired Carmen Brasillo, the Giants did. And I asked them, I said, what kind of person are they getting in Priscilla? What does he believe in? And they both told me he believes in versatility. And sure enough, when um, when, when Carmen was asked about his philosophy with offensive linemen, he said, look, I favor versatility. You know, specifically to Evan Neal. He was asked about Evan Neal. And um, he did confirm that Neal will start at right tackle, as in he will start the summer at right tackle. But he will also have an opportunity to learn other positions, right? Because Priscilla wants versatility. Now, this goes back to, again, what Hondo Carpenter, who is my colleague over on uh, Raiders Today on the uh, on the Band Nation Network, um, he told me that he likes vers- versatility. If you're not a top five player at your position on the offensive line, you're going to be asked to do multiple things. And sure enough, that's what where Evan Neal is headed. Now, Evan Neal is still, you know, not able to participate in 11 on 11. That was handled by Joshua Zudu in today's practice. So you have to wonder, you know, how much is he going to fall behind uh, this spring? You know, we'll see if he's ready to start training camp. He's got plenty of time yet. So really no, t- not enough time, you know, or, or, or too early, I should say, to to panic about Evan Neal and whether he's going to be ready or not. But um, I do think he's going to be cross-trained at both tackle and guard, whether that's right guard, left guard, or whatever, he's going to get cross-trained. I mean, I'm I'm convinced of that. Dable hinted to that, 
and Brasillo pretty much said the same thing. Um, let's talk about the starting five offensive linemen. Now, last year, as you all know, the Giants couldn't decide on a starting five until literally a few days before their week one game against Dallas, which was a huge, huge mistake. So I asked Carmen, I said, at what point do you want to have your starting five set in your mind? And he said, you know, right now he's not worried about it because, you know, they're in their underwear, so to speak. Um, He wants to get through training camp. He wants to get through the preseason games. But the goal for him is to get that the starting five solidified by the time the preseason games are done. And then you have sort of like that 10 day period where you can get these guys up and running and, you know, really solidify the the communication and whatnot. But, you know, he does believe in, you know, mixing and matching a little bit because you never know with injuries. And he likes the versatility, as I mentioned, because you can only keep eight uh, offensive linemen active on a game day. So he wants to be able to have, options if god forbid there is an injury so he says if he doesn't have his starting five in mind by the time the season you know the the preseason games are done then he's going to worry so that was very um reassuring to hear um carmen also was asked uh about you know john runyon who as you all know john runyon i believe said he prefers to play left guard and he's been playing right guard in this camp and the starting offensive line by the way for those wondering uh left tackle andrew thomas left guard has been uh jermaine illuminor center john michael schmitz right guard has been um john runyon and then right tackle you know and the 11 on 11 has been uh or today at any rate was uh joshua azudu So it's going to be Evan Neal at some point. But here's a thought for you regarding why the Giants may have flipped the order there and put John Runyon on the right side. You know, um, Carmen said that when it came to Illuminor, why was he playing, you know, guard, not tackle? He said, well, he played a lot of tackle for us last year, meaning for the Raiders. So we want to get him, you know, kind of back on the bicycle, so to speak, at guard. So, you know, they're trying to get uh, Illuminor brushed up on, on guard. So why put John Runyon on the right side if he's allegedly more comfortable on the left side? Here's a thought for you guys. If Illuminor is still, you know, kind of reacquainting himself with playing guard, whereas Runyon has played guard, you know, his the last however many years of his career, is it possible that they feel, that Carmen Brasillo feels that putting uh, John Runyon next to Evan Neal is going to help him as opposed to, you know, putting Illuminor there. And that's not to say that Illuminor would be any kind of, you know, uh, liability, but you want a guy who's kind of, who can kind of play guard in his sleep. And that guy right now is John Runyon Jr. So I wonder if that's maybe behind the thinking of putting running on the right side because ultimately they want him to settle down Evan Neal. You know, a a lot of times, you know, coaches do that. They have a veteran at guard that they put next to a young tackle and that guard kind of settles down that young tackle who's been struggling. So I think that's the reason. Um, Nobody confirmed that for me. I couldn't get a straight answer on it. It's just me, you know, using deductive reasoning as to why they're going in that direction. One other thing I'll mention real quick about the offensive line, uh, just watching them doing their drills in the seven on sevens, uh, I'm sorry, the 11 on 11s, um, they were hustling a lot faster to the line. You know, in the past, you know, they would, the offensive linemen would kind of, you know, slowly jog to the offense, you know, to the line of scrimmage and get set. This group was really hustling. They were getting to the line, getting set. And you know what, folks, I think that's going to help the quarterback. And I say that because the sooner the guys up front get set, that gives the quarterback maybe a little bit more time to survey what the defense is doing, make his pre-snap reads, make any adjustments that need be. Because how many times in the past have we seen giant quarterbacks run the clock down to the nub because everybody just wasn't set and, oh, my God, now all of a sudden, you know, we got to roll with it. So. I noticed that and I thought that was pretty, you know, interesting 
that they would go uh, and have them those guys literally run to the off to to the uh, line of scrimmage after they broke the huddle. All right, coming up next, I've got more observations from OTA number five, and coming up on the show, I'm going to tell you about a sleeper pick, a guy who kind of jumped out at me that. I don't know if he's going to make the roster, but he sure is making an early case for it. So that's coming your way right after this quick break. Hey, Giant fans, passion, drive, and patience. What brings home the winning trophy is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay's Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. From superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with the eBay's guaranteed fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusion supply, eBay's guaranteed fit, only available to U.S. customers. All right, everybody, welcome back to the Locked on Giants podcast. I'm your host, Patricia Trena. Coming up next week on Locked on Giants, I'm going to have a guest from Pro Football Focus. I'm going to likely have Ed Valentine on the show from Big Blue View. Ed has been with me. Uh, he's a frequent guest here on the program. Um, I'm hoping to get Emery Hunt on the program. Emery's been at the OTAs as well. So it's always good to cross check, you know, because there's just so much going on at these practices that sometimes you don't see something. And what you don't see, maybe, you know, your, your fellow colleagues saw. So it's always a good idea to cross check. So that's some of what's coming up next week on the Locked on Giants podcast. I mean, we're supposed to go three days a week next week, but we're going to keep going five because there's still a lot of spring football left to bring you. And we're going to bring it to you here on Locked on Giants. All right, let's continue um, OTA five takeaways. And, you know, this is really not a surprise, but the topic to come up, um, Brian Dable is he confirmed that he's been calling the plays for the for the bulk of the spring folks you know he, even though he hasn't said it he's calling the plays this year it is pretty obvious at this point he's going to be the play caller and you know I, I tried to get an answer out of him regarding what goes into the determination as to who calls the plays and is there a concern that you know switching the play calling from Dable to, to uh, I'm sorry, from Kafka, Mike Kafka, the offensive coordinator to Dable, how does that kind of affect the continuity? And Dable didn't really give me an answer. He just basically said, you know, hey, I've called plays before. I'm comfortable doing it. I like doing it. Folks, if they're going to go down with the ship, if this season is going to be a bad one, and let's hope it's not, by the way, but if it is, Dable's probably going to want to do everything he can to make sure that he gives himself a fighting chance of, you know, keeping the ship afloat. So I think Dable, you know, it's just a matter of time before he he, he says, I'm calling the plays. So uh, he said that no decision will be made until after the preseason games, but I'm pretty sure the decision's been made. All right, Daniel Jones ran around um, in seven-on-seven seven, um, against air when he did, when they did 11 on versus air uh, individual drills. Daniel Jones is coming along, looked uh, to move very well. Still not clear to do eleven on eleven. Dable said they're making pro that he's making progress, but there's still you know a ways to go there, and they're waiting for clearance from the from the trainers. The hope, as you know, I think I've said before, is that he's ready for the starter training camp. So we'll have to see on that. But um, I did want to talk about the backup quarterbacks really quick because I know that's a big, you know, question a lot of you have. I thought Drew Locke had a better practice uh, today. He was a little bit more accurate. It wasn't perfect because one of the things with Drew Locke that, you know, kind of can drive you crazy is that while he's more decisive post-snap, sometimes the decisions he does make are just not the right ones and he ends up badly missing a guy or 
throwing a ball where you, you just sit there and you say, where are you throwing it to? But you know what? Drew Locke spoke about how he's having fun in this offense, how he likes this offense and how he's coming along. And he, you know, compared to the practice we saw a couple of weeks ago when he just was all over the place, he was, a, he was a lot sharper in this practice. So we're still some errant balls, but a lot sharper. Um, Tommy DeVito, I thought was probably the best quarterback out of the three. Uh, Tommy DeVito was going to make things very interesting for this team. I think come roster cut down date in at the end of August. And I say that because typically the giants like to keep two quarterbacks on the roster and then a third one on the practice squad. Tommy DeVito keeps progressing the way he has. He's going to make it really, really tough for the giants because look, if they wave him, there ain't no way he's getting through waivers if he plays as well as he's been doing. And I again, I, I still say for the preseason, um, you're going to see Drew Locke and Tommy DeVito take the bulk of the steps. And if Tommy DeVito plays as well in the preseason as he's been practicing in the practices that I've seen him in, um, he's going to make it tough. And the Giants might very well have to carry uh, three quarterbacks. I don't think they would want to do that. And, you know, obviously you talk about injuries and stuff like that, but you just kind of get the feeling that that's where it's headed. So that's something to keep an eye on, certainly this summer. Okay. Um, I know some of you have asked me about uh, Nathan Rourke. Today's practice, he was kind of all over the place. Wasn't very, you know, impressed by what he, by him throwing the ball. I thought he was, he ran the ball well. He did a lot of, you know, quick, scrambles and whatnot but uh so far i haven't really seen anything in fairness i've only seen two practices two spring practices so i'll obviously i'll defer to the coaches on that but uh yeah i, I today's practice from uh, nathan Moore just really to me left something to be desired um one injury note real quick gunner olszewski the punt returner um, slipped on the grass at the, at, towards the uh, beginning of the practice. And uh, his left leg, I'm not sure if it was his knee or his ankle, but he threw his gloves down in frustration. So hopefully that injury is not that bad. Um, Gunnar Olszewski just, you know, he was really good as a punt returner. And it's interesting because the Giants, you know, they have a group of guys who stand back there fielding punts or, you know, just you know, handling the punts from off the the, uh, the jugs machine, and I thought it was kind of interesting because usually there's a couple guys back there that you just know are not going to be on the punt return team or, or even be under consideration to return punts. And um, they, the one guy that was not back there, which should indicate that this is the end of this experiment, was Eric Gray. He was not back there field and punts, which, you know, a lot of those guys do it just to have practice catching like the deep ball and everything like that. But Eric Gray, they, they're keeping him away from the punt return group. Um, there was one roster transaction. Um, Gary Brightwell running back was waived and uh, which, which is no surprise. You know, I hate to say it, but I didn't think uh, Gary Brightwell was going to, um, to make the roster anyway. And the Giants sign defensive back uh, Elijah Riley, so that's a guy that uh, that they really you know that they really liked. So uh, so yeah, Elijah Riley added to the roster. Gary Brightwell is headed to IR, assuming he passes through waivers. So all right, coming up, more observations from OTA number five, including a guy that is emerging as a sleeper. And hint, it's not Elijah Chapman, who I spoke about as a potential sleeper, um, probably when I did my last OTA review. This is somebody totally different. Who is it? Stick around and you will find out. All right, everybody, welcome back to the Locked on Giants podcast. I'm your host, Patricia Trena. And... The time has come. You guys want to know who's the sleeper that jumped out at me at this practice. Now, before I tell you who it is, I'm going to say that 
I don't know if this, there's going to be room on the 53-man roster for this player. Um, but this is a guy that – a little backstory for you. Um, he is an, a premium undrafted free agent, meaning he got a signing bonus. He is also a guy that over on G uh, New York Giants on SI, we did a training camp profile on him. Uh, actually, Coach Gene Clemens, who was our guest yesterday, did the profile, and he spoke about this guy glowingly. So I said, okay, you know what? Let me keep an eye and let me just see if he, he pops out. I'm talking about wide receiver Ayer uh, Asante. Now, Ayer Asante is a slot receiver, so it's a crowded position. Right there you would say, eh, I don't think he's going to make it. But the guy has good vision. He's got good burst. He can separate. I saw one play in which he separated by a mile from the defensive back. I think Dane Belton was the defensive back in coverage. Um, and Asante can also return punts. So that being said, now you wonder and you say, okay, is he up against Gunnar Olszewski, for example? You know, maybe if this kid shows something, can he bump Olszewski off the roster? Or if Olszewski, you know, gets hurt, which again, he did unfortunately today. And it's a long, if it's a long-term thing, does this Asante kid, you know, service insurance, but he's a guy that really, you know, to me jumped out um, with his play today. I thought he had a really, really good practice. And um, you know, again, it's, I know it's against, it, it, they're in their pajamas right now, but the guy looked good. Um, I thought he was one of the, the stars of practice. Uh, some other observations for you. Steve Smith, the former Carolina Panther receiver, was a guest of Brian Dables in camp today. And Steve Smith, you know, he has been around. He's he's uh, been around the Giants a, a few times here and there. What I like about it is Steve Smith comes in and he doesn't just stand there with his arms folded, what taken in the practice. He actually gets involved with coaching. <laughs> and uh, he was really working with um, the younger receivers, particularly Malik Neighbors and Jalen Hyatt. And one of the, you know, I was watching them because they were on the, the near sideline closest to where the media was standing. And one of the things Steve Smith was teaching these guys was how to defeat the jam. All right. So he was showing them, you know, hand placement and hand movement ways to defeat a jam off the line of scrimmage. That is a skill in particular that neighbors is going to really need to have in his back pocket because I am pretty sure that he and, and, and Jalen Hyatt as well, being the speedsters that they are, they are going to probably see some physical bumping and, and, and jamming from opposing defensive backs. So Steve Smith, who was an expert at, at, you know, defeating the jam, if he can teach these guys how to defeat it, how to, you know, quick, you know, get a quick release off the line of scrimmage and, and get downfield and into their patterns without having their timing disrupted. Hey, I'm all for it. And, and that's what Steve Smith was. One of the things that he was working with, with those two guys. And like I said, he, he was, he was particularly glued to the hips of neighbors and Jalen, uh, Jalen Hyatt, um, during the, the practices, particularly when they were doing special teams, he was working with them on the side you know, showing them, you know, these little techniques and stuff like that. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Okay. Defensive line. Um, for those of you who are wondering, DJ Davidson got first team reps. Now, I don't know if that was because they were missing a couple guys. I think Timmy Horn wasn't there. And I forget there was another defensive lineman that I didn't see there, but I know Jordan Riley was there. But DJ Davidson, for this practice at any rate, was getting first team reps. So kind of interesting because DJ Davidson, you know, you, you think, all right, he's more versatile than Jordan Riley. I think Jordan Riley is probably more of a nose tackle, more of the backup nose tackle to Dexter Lawrence, whereas Davidson can play uh, inside or he can he can go outside if they need him to do that. So that's why I, I think possibly he was um, moved out uh, or, or moved into the uh, the first team reps and. From what I could tell, you know, and again, with, with defensive line and offensive line, you need to see them with the pads on. But, you know, 
as far as executing the assignments, he got a lot of praise. I heard the coaches yell, got a boy, you know, good job, you know. So uh, that was certainly encouraging to to see for, for DJ Davidson. Um, okay, a couple of other small things. Darren Waller, no update on him. Um, I don't know if you all saw the video that he released. He released a music video. Uh, it's kind of, the last scene is kind of, you know, how can I put this? It's like, it, it gets your attention. So I'm hoping Darren Waller is okay. Basically, for those who haven't seen it, he he had a, a, a woman in the video that was supposedly a doppelganger for Kelsey Plum, his estranged wife. That They're in the process of a divorce. And Waller just, you know, the, the longer this goes on, folks, I'm he's not coming back. I would be absolutely shocked if he comes back. Um, I just hope he's okay. Again, you know, person to person, I hope Darren Waller is okay. Darius Slayton was in camp and he revealed that the Giants did adjust his contract for this coming year. They didn't extend it, but they gave him an opportunity to reach incentives. So he, he got a little extra money in the deal, assuming that he reaches these incentives. Now, I don't have all the details on what those incentives are. I'm working to get them, but I'm curious if he does reach them. And you know what? I think he might. And here's why I say that, you know, everybody seems to want to run Darius Slayton off the team. Now that uh, Malik neighbors is here, I wouldn't be so quick to run him off the team. You know, I think, you know, neighbors and Slayton can form a nice one, two punch in that offense. And then, you know, you have Wandale Robinson in the slot. I think Allen Robinson can be the big slot. And then Jalen Hyatt can be, you know, can be in that mix as well. Jalen Hyatt might just end up being the heir apparent to Darius Slayton's spot. So very interesting dynamic there, but I, I just, too many people want to run off Darius Slayton and, you know, I, I, I just don't see it right now. Now, obviously if the Giants, you know, they tank or not tank, but if they have a bad season, a bad start to where they have a fire sale, maybe they move them. I don't know, but I don't see them looking to move them, you know, before that. So anyway, that's all I have for you right now. Now I'm still unpacking some other stuff from the assistant coaches. Um, so I may have a follow-up show for you on what some of the assistant coaches said um, starting from Monday. So I've got a lot of more content for you. Just have to see how it all plays off. And again, I have the guests coming. Um, Pro Football Focus has a guest that they booked on the show. Ed Valentine is going to be on the show. Emery Hunt is supposed to be on the show at some point. So that's plenty of stuff coming your way. Please, if you watch us on the YouTube, subscribe to the channel, like the video, ring the little bell for notifications every time we post a new video. And if you listen to us on our audio platforms, if you wouldn't mind giving us a nice review, that would be appreciated. All right, Giant fans, that's going to do it for this edition. Have a great weekend. I'll be back with you on Monday with an all new episode of Locked on Giants.